All right, so welcome back to Evil Thespian. I'm here with Eric Dose. He is a harpist. He also performs under the name Hamburger Helpless. <laughs> Eric, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you for having me. Doing a little better at a yes. crazy day. But yeah. uh, really happy to be on the pod. And I just <laughs> want to say, I, I, I noticed the... Uh, the like assonance between and, and the similarity in font between Evangelion and Evil Thespian. That was a little Easter egg that I didn't. Uh, yes. I oh just my kind gosh. Of in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> oh my gosh! I uh, it took me like twelve hours to like design, just choose one font, and then I was trying to um, put little animations and like little light flares around it and it looked too much alike and i was like no 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 we got to take it down a little bit um (laughs) but well i'm excited so i mean we have first things first when how why the harp like when did this happen how does one how did you start playing the harp uh so it was in 2012 when i started playing um, and I've been self-taught the whole time. I've never had a teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had people give me like helpful tips and stuff like that, but I started playing kind of on my own uh, out of a love for the instrument. I used to play guitar, and my first instrument was actually cello. Um, I was inspired to play when I was 12 years old. I got really mm-hmm. into Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is like my favorite show of all time. And so my mom got me the soundtrack for Christmas, and there was the uh, the goth, campy cello band mm-hmm. Rasputina. Yes. Yeah, and they became my favorite band when you know for quite a few years when I was a teenager. I went to all their shows, and yeah. they inspired me to play music in general. Mm-hmm. And I took to the cello because it was their instrument. Melora mm-hmm. Craig's vision of the cello was so unique, mm-hmm. and for like a Cuban boy from Queens. Who like grew up hearing hip hop? You know, my dad. You know, my parents mm-hmm. were teenagers when I was born, so I grew up mm-hmm. with a lot of '90s music, but I'd never heard mm-hmm. anything like that before. Yeah. So I was very taken in by that kind of vision of mm-hmm. like kind of classical instruments in a contemporary setting. Yeah, and that kind of followed me through to the harp. I had an intern with the guitar. I played mm-hmm. a kind of percussive, kind of slappy, tappy. Mm-hmm. guitar not math rock but like yeah. inspired by like kind of acoustic guitarists who did mm-hmm. do that stuff like khaki king um mm-hmm. stuff like that that was and those you were my doing with the, the cello too yeah you know yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, I played guitar for a while as a teenager and i kind of started running into um, walls with it because all I would, I would i used the kind of joni mitchell approach which was mm-hmm. going into alternate tunings and just mm-hmm. kind of playing whatever and kind of writing in that way. But I had no solid music theory foundation. Even mm-hmm. though I played cello, um, I had some experience with cello. I was thrown into an in, like an advanced kind of intermediate class in junior high. And I was mm-hmm. just getting by on my sense of rhythm. I could barely read mm-hmm. music. I didn't really understand what was going on, but I played anyway. Um, mm-hmm. I also played double Very bass. Very relatable. I, Nice. Yeah, yeah. You just do what you can to get by. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And um, I had no idea why. Mm-hmm. When I was in college and playing guitar, a lot of people didn't really want to play with me. It's because I really had no idea what I was doing. So mm-hmm. um, I kind of got tired of just doing the thing that I was always doing on guitar. Mm-hmm. And that was in New York. And I relocated to Oregon. Uh, I did a year and a half on a PhD track in philosophy, which mm-hmm. I wasn't really jiving with. But while I was there, um, I started dating this guy who I'd kind of met right away, who's mm-hmm. friends with a roommate. And um, and his mom came to visit, um, and she, uh, we kind of bonded over... His mom's a really cool lady. She's a musician, too. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, she loved Joanna Newsom. I love Joanna Newsom. So we kind of uh, bonded over that. And she says, oh, I have this little harp at home. This mm-hmm. little 22-string harp. So she goes back to, you know, we were in Oregon. She goes mm-hmm. back to uh, SoCal, where she lives. 
And a few weeks later, I got this heart in this little heart in the mail, yeah. and I was shocked and overjoyed. And she could no longer play. She gave it to me because she could no longer play because she, um, uh, she's I guess developing like arthritis mm-hmm. or she was having trouble playing. So she thought it would be mm-hmm. better in my hands, and I just took to it immediately. I fell in love. Wow. I was already in love with the instrument. Um, yeah, you know, from like Joanna Newsom or hearing like Bjork's Vespertine mm-hmm. or. Um, other harp music I'd been listening to at the time, but it was just... Well, my, um, my question before we get into how you started, like, mm-hmm. practicing and playing and writing, um, mm-hmm. when did you first, like, do you have a memory of when you first started listening to Joanna Newsom or when you first discovered her? Yeah. <laughs> or you, like, any, like, the first time you listened to her and... <laughs> yeah. They, oh, you fell in love with her and the harp like at the same time. Not that's, quite. that's how I felt. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I was intimidated by her at first. <laughs> um, it was that summer that uh, I, I was going to see Rasputina play a lot. It was 2006. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was starting to get more and more. I, I remember getting to like Fiona Apple that summer too. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. I, all, I remember. Yeah. I can see exactly the moment that you were in because I yeah, had this moment. I was in that like moment. Fiona Apple, uh, yeah. Joanna Newsom, like yeah. early Sia album, like mm-hmm. era yeah, too. That. Like, oh yeah. man, so many. It's yeah. a, it was a good time. <laughs> I was kind of transitioning out of my like heart, like kind of teenage boy hard rock and industrial and goth music yeah. which I still yeah. kind of which I still loved I was like yeah. I loved Nine Inch Nails for a long time so I was into like Joy Division mm-hmm. and all that stuff yeah, yeah, but yeah. I was starting to get more and more into like singer songwriters and I had I remember uh, just seeing buzz about Joanna Newsom I think East mm-hmm. was about to come out mm-hmm. and it had maybe had just leaked too and I exposed mm-hmm. myself to some of it, and I liked a couple of the songs, but I was so thrown back by it. And I, I, it took me a while to really acclimate to her vocals um, mm-hmm. and to her style in general and to the long songs. I loved long mm-hmm. songs at the time, but yeah. I had been so... Uh, I, I wasn't ready for it for at least you don't, a year. You don't know where to start. Like, it mm-hmm. is intimidating because... Yeah. You, you've, it gives, like... She gives the impression, like, when you first discover her, like, oh, I must be, like, so... I have to be so intellectual, and I have to know everything about the uh-huh. lyrics and the world building no. of this. Um, no. But, yeah. No, I know how that feeling is, but... <laughs> so that feeling subsided when I when mm-hmm. I kind of just took to it, but I remember the first year of knowing who she was, and I only really vibed with, like, Book of Right mm-hmm. On, uh, Peach yeah, Trump yeah, Air, yeah. Sprout and the Bean. Those songs mm-hmm. were the only... Those were like the three songs that I listened to. I, I mm-hmm. returned to them quite a lot, but I found her really challenging until about 2008 when I, in my mm-hmm. freshman year of college at Purchase College, um, mm-hmm. and that's when I just, I just was totally mm-hmm. kind of like ensconced in her mm-hmm. sound and mm-hmm. just taken in completely. I was just such a fanboy at that moment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't even. It's hard to describe how influential she is because mm-hmm. uh, you you don't even you don't even even realize her influence until you really think about it and she uh, is very unique in the way she uh, distributes and uh, yeah her, and, and entertains her audience in such a yeah. specific way um, yeah. it's very it's like so inspiring and I guess the I have this memory of listening to bridges and balloons like I grew up in Wisconsin, so I uh-huh. used are my family and I used to like, drive like really up north to a really like big log cabin in the middle of like nowhere almost in like Canada. And I have this memory of like in the pitch black dark pressing my face up against the car window and listening to bridges and balloons <laughs> in my earphones. And <laughs> I would do that all the time, like so, uh, like, such a nerd, I would always listen to her in nature, like, <laughs> in the nighttime totally, and stuff. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I would love to, I, you know, this is something I still do to this day. Well, I go yeah. on those kinds of, like, walks, on those, like, Lindy walks. Mm-hmm. I go yes, on those the, walks. it's such a, yeah, it's the perfect <laughs> music for a good, a good Lindy walk. Right? For the Lindy <laughs> walk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, but I listen so. to all kinds of music when I go on those mm-hmm. walks. But you know, one of the mm-hmm. like mainstays are mm-hmm. things from her discography. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, have one. I have one on me is just mm-hmm. one of my favorite records. I think yeah. it's, that's my favorite record of hers. But it's just mm-hmm. like in my top records of any mm-hmm. artist. Uh, is such it, a is there a what about that uh, album? Differs from the or just oh. the sound. Man, um, well, well for, I love the, the instrumentation. All the arrangements mm-hmm. are just so yeah. beautifully beautifully rendered and performed. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was, that, that's the vision of Ryan Francesconi, the guy who plays mm-hmm. like the tombra, the Bulgarian tombra. First of all, I love that there is like this kind of um, Eastern element in her music, this kind of like, um, like this like Mediterranean kind of vibe. Yeah, um, in some of the string arrangements that, that yeah. appear in her music, and it's uh, it's all that the Bulgarian tambra, that kind of thing that mm-hmm. looks like a lute or a mandolin. Yes, um, yeah. Untrained eye, but it has its yeah. own sound, and it just uh, the way it melds with the harp, especially on the track Colleen from I actually mm-hmm. have it right here from this EP mm-hmm. on the East mm-hmm. Street Band EP. Phenom- this whole EP, there's a performance of Cosmia on this that is just so yeah. stunningly so breathtaking. Good. But uh, and I, yeah. I just do- I could just be such a dork about her music. Yeah, yeah. I know, and like there's an element to this is true with the harp as well. There's sort of an element of cultural preservation with mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. upkeep and the practice of the harp or other uh, instruments yeah. that you don't really see people, uh, you know, would use uh, commonly anymore or include in, like, their canon of instruments that they know how to play. Um, yeah. And there's, like, such a lost uh, world of not only music styles um, but mm-hmm. and, like cultural uh, sounds that have been like forgotten or just culturally er- eroded over time yeah. but there's just think about the instruments that were used with that um so yeah. my my maiden name in croatian means syndra player so uh-huh. it means like some kind of like <laughs> string instrument like uh huh. sitar player or something Boy. i don't know but i That's always so think cool. <laughs> yeah i always think uh yeah, it's probably just like equivalent to like popper boy or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, yeah. but yeah, I think of all these instruments that yeah. are like very indigenous to the region yeah. uh, I, of the kind of music uh, that came out. Yeah, yeah, I lo- oh, I love her uh, preservation of just like natural instruments. Uh, that kind of commitment on that yeah. record specifically on Have One on Me. Because on mm-hmm. Divers, she uses a lot of, like, synthesizers, uh, which was something that I'd been hoping for before that record came out. I was like, oh, man, mm-hmm. I hope her next record she uses. She kind of delves into, like, analog synth. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. But uh, on Have One On Me, uh, the, uh, just this preservation of... Because uh, she's mm-hmm. trying to, to uh, pay homage to Grass Valley, where she grew up in mm-hmm. Northern California. So there's just this Im- immersion in nature mm-hmm. and natural metaphor. But you have all these fantastic instruments like the tambra like the caval mm-hmm. like this kind of yeah. like recorder instrument yeah um, they, well, they're all- what is that what is that song that she has that, a very recent song i remember when the video came out it's um uh it's the one she writes about like indigenous people oh. land yeah. what is it called yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called Sapaconican. Sapaconican. Okay, that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember it. I used to know all the lyrics, um, and I remember when that yeah. video came out, and I was like, "Yeah, this is, um, yeah, this. It, it's kind of uh, in the same vein as her, like, whole uh, like lyrical practice. It's like, very um, explicitly about uh, like cultural pr- and preservation, and like honoring yeah. the people who came before you." Yeah, that, memorialization, yeah. Um, um, industrialization. <laughs> yeah, because her mm-hmm. her kind of approach to the voice um, and to songwriting kind of uh, 
began, like with the Milk Eyed Mender, she was kind mm-hmm. of listening to a lot of, in the time leading up to the Milk Eyed Mender in 2004, I'm aware that she was really interested in the Lomax archives, um, mm-hmm. which was like an archive of uh, old, like Appalachian folk, folk mm-hmm. singing, things from like the 1800s, early 1900s, mm-hmm. all kind of like. Uh, antique music that you know mm-hmm. would have been lost to time, but was uh, what is his name? Uh, I might be totally wrong. <laughs> Willie Lomax? I don't know. I, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the Lomax archives. She was mm-hmm. really influenced by that, and like Texas Gladden. Oh, but mm-hmm. um, beyond that, like Karen Dalton, who's a fantastic uh, f- uh, kind of folk musician of the 1960s Greenwich Village scene. Mm-hmm. Um, who had, who had a voice that kind of, uh, that Joanna's harkens back to. I usually mm-hmm. don't, uh, I usually just refer to her as Newsome because I don't know her personally. I don't like calling her. Yeah. Her. That sounds so personal. Yeah, I know. It, it would, yeah. Newsome it usually <laughs> harkens back to mm-hmm. Karen Dalton with her voice. Mm-hmm. Um, the, while maintaining, uh, her total originality and uniqueness, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's get into... Um, your songwriting and harp mm. practice. When did you first start writing songs on the harp? On the harp, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, that was 2018. Because I'd written mm-hmm. songs before, but they were on guitar, mm-hmm. and I took a long break uh, mm-hmm. because I got very self-conscious about my writing and how I didn't really mm-hmm. know what I was doing um, and what I was kind of churning out on guitar. After a while, it became very kind of predictable because I didn't really know the rules and how to break them in, mm-hmm. in creative ways. Um, so it took me a while to start writing on harp. I kind of had to mm-hmm. learn the basics. I had to acquaint myself. I kind of worked up to the harp that's behind me. The thirty. I have a thirty-six string lever harp. Mm-hmm. Um, which I tune to uh, D flat major. Most lever harpists tune their harps to E flat major. Mm-hmm. But um, I was learning on a small. Uh, I first started learning on a s- small, like twenty-two string lever harp. Uh, the next harp I got was a thirty string lever harp, and then I got this one in twenties end of twenty sixteen. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of began um, arranging like seventies soul and like gospel and R and B music, like mm-hmm. things from the seventies I was interested in and like nineties mm-hmm. house music. I wanted to really yeah. play that kind of stuff on harp. So I That's remember so like cool. working on a version of like Crystal Waters, uh Gypsy Woman, she's homeless. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I have a version of that that I still play. Um mm-hmm. but I started writing um once I kind of became more confident in playing on harp. Um and the first song I wrote was a song called Parakeet. That's 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 on the record, mm-hmm. um, and then I wrote another song called "Smoke in Bed," mm-hmm. uh, and then "It's History" came along. These these the other songs mm-hmm. on the record they just kind of slowly accumulated after a while. I think yeah. I wrote something like twenty songs, but mm-hmm. um, as far as process, it's all improv and practice and repetitive, mm-hmm. re- re- playing things repetitively, and then kind of kind of carving out nuances Mm -hmm. and then kind of lyrics always come last because vocal well vocal melody comes first which Mm -hmm. is difficult enough to arrive because i'm so involved in what i'm playing on harp that a vocal melody will arrive sometime after i have a kind Mm -hmm. of concrete structure Mm -hmm. of the harp Mm -hmm. music and then i work out the lyrics i have like notes in my iphone of just like Mm-hmm. lines that'll come to my mind but if I'm lucky they work with a given melody that happens mm-hmm. and then you know I'll reconcile yeah. everything over time yeah it takes me about like could take me up to a year to really have a complete finished version of a song that I feel oh. confident playing in front of people it yeah. takes I'm, I'm the same way for me the structure is first Mm-hmm. But it's a lot of repetition because it's a mixture of my uh, leftover, um, like reaching into the file cabinet of my brain and like trying to grasp at like um, my forgotten music theory knowledge and the cello yeah. and everything. And yeah, then yeah. Rep- just so much repetition over and over again, playing the same um, 
progressions for hours, like hours. Yeah, same. Oh, um, no, same. Completely. Yeah, and I will, like, when I don't put headphones on, I'm like, more, my poor husband is, like, listening to the same <laughs> thing over and over again so loud. Um, but yeah, that's what, do you what you, you gotta do. Do you still play cello? I don't, but I do play, I have a couple of uh, uh, pianos, like a couple keyboards. Nice. I just play um, on and off. And I wanted, you know, some, I do miss the cello sometimes, but for me, I mostly stopped because I uh, studied, I didn't study music in college and it's just the um, maintenance and upkeep of taking care of a large instrument. Mm -hmm. um, just the yeah. way my life was and like the way my life is now, it really came down to a matter of humidity <laughs> um, huh. because uh, with the cello, I wasn't very, I, uh, in school, I wasn't really good at all those practical things that we learned. Like I had to learn how to tune it. And the, these are such ancient instruments. You have to have yeah. a very strong upper body. I couldn't tune the pegs. I would like break <laughs> strings all the time. It really, um, like I liked playing it, but it's, there's a lot of maintenance when you have like such a large instrument, not only like carrying it around and uh, traveling with it, it's very delicate um, yeah. of an instrument. Like it's like a, yeah, yeah it's like a giant violin, <laughs> like yeah. it's just so yeah. delicate. Um, I remember, and I was so I remember bad. breaking so many strings. Like mm -hmm. when yeah. I first started playing it, it's so easy to just snap a string, but. Yeah, but I don't play anymore. I think if I, did have a cello here because the the weather just really <laughs> the humidity levels and the weather um, i don't know about the harp but if you have a cello like you have to maintain certain humidity levels because the wood expands and it fills up and then it breathes like yeah, it literally yeah, like yeah. moves and breathes um and the i same goes for the harp yeah oh yeah so i was oh that's why i was always bad at tuning it I, was, I never really learned, uh, they tried to teach me, but I just couldn't. I never really learned how to tune well um, mm -hmm. and didn't really practice enough. Um, do you tune, uh, how, what is the upkeep involved with a harp? <laughs> yeah, That's my question. You know, they say that you should change strings once a year, but um, mm -hmm. I, I haven't, I think I've changed the strings once in the entire time that I've owned You gotta this work with what you got, yeah. Gotta work with what I got, because it's yes. expensive. Yes, it is. Um, it's so expensive. You know, I, you know, I don't make a lot of money, so I don't really yeah. have a lot to really keep up this harp. So every, mm -hmm. so I, just, I try to be as caring towards it as I can. I play it every day, mm -hmm. you know, almost every day, as much as mm -hmm. I can. But I, t you know, I tune it fairly often. I, you know, it takes me, it used to take me like 40 minutes to tune the thing, but now I think mm -hmm. I got it down to like, I can tune it within 15, 10 to 15 minutes if I'm, yeah. you know, if I'm good. Yeah. But, what is uh, the, um, so what's it like carrying it on the, the subway? Um, uh, kind it of seems a, like a very sturdy instrument. Oh, it's quite sturdy. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's sturdier than I give it credit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of a nightmare. It's a it can, it can be a nightmare mm -hmm. lugging around the subway. It's not fun. Mm -hmm. uh, the I have wheels for it, um, but they're not the most practical wheels. I feel like I could have gotten a better like harp mm -hmm. dolly that would mm -hmm. that would ease ease the go of it. But um, yeah. you got to you know really watch out for the gap between the train and the platform. You know that they're, they're like you sure. know, they're, stairwells in the subway or like oh. stairs in the subway you can like i've like knocked my harp a couple times into the like the, mm -hmm. the ceiling above the stairs you know it's mm -hmm. it's it's kind of nerve-wracking and you gotta like understand what time oh when is it going to be a good time to go if i have mm -hmm. like if i have to get to a gig by train and mm -hmm. the gigs at like i gotta be at the gig at like seven i can't be going at rush hour i can't fit onto a train with my heart at rush hour mm -hmm. you know yeah. so i always have to get there a little yeah. earlier than that you know mm -hmm. um playing in the subway is a different thing which i'm still getting used to mm -hmm. um and i've had more mishaps happen than i'd like like the, the, <laughs> the whole platform with the wheels like falling off when i get to the bottom of the stairs it's yeah. always disorienting the harp will go out of tune i'll have to sit yeah. there and tune. 
mm-hmm. you know, uh, but but it's a gift. It's a blessing. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I was once I was talking to this uh, musician on Instagram, uh, Scott Stenton. He's a guitarist that uh, plays like a double necked guitar and really fantastic mm-hmm. stuff. But he says, you know, you're lucky to be able to do this, and it's it's mm-hmm. really true. To be in New York mm-hmm. City, you know, which is where I grew up, this is my home. Uh, to be here and to be able to go, so, you know, into public and just play your instrument and you know casually uh, engage with people. I I had a really fantastic uh, gig recently at a restaurant um, on Bleecker Street, where when I got there, I kind of felt like chopped liver because uh, every you know everybody at the restaurant was so busy getting the restaurant ready, which I totally understand. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was just kind of sitting there by myself, not it was just tuning mm-hmm. and like waiting for anybody mm-hmm. to like talk to me and tell me, mm-hmm. you know, when I was starting up and stuff. But um, they eventually put me right outside. It was on Valentine's Day. They put me right outside Aww. because it was such a, a tight restaurant that it made more sense for me to be right in front. And that's yeah. when I actually got it, the most. That was the most rewarding part of it because. I had all the people passing by and people mm-hmm. just stopping and admiring the instrument and handing me cash. Yeah. It was really yeah. sweet. A friend of mine just happened to be walking down Bleecker Street and ran, and just ran into me and said hi. So, you know, I, I, it's it's a great experience getting out there and playing. Mm-hmm. But the subway aspect is, <laughs> that's the hurdle, you know. I can't imagine. Have you ever... Like drop, like there's like bumps on the way to the gig, but have you ever completely like dropped or has it fallen over in public? <laughs> Luckily, no. The mm-hmm. the worst thing so far that's happened, and I mean anything can happen because it's it's the MTA, it's it's, it's a New York City subway. Mm-hmm. But um, w- the worst thing that happened was the first time, which was I, and my friend Joey was with me. And we were getting the harp down the stairs. This is at the Seventh Ave stop in, Pro- in Park Slope, uh, right near, not right near where I live. And um, just I didn't have the platform that with the wheels. It's it's they're the harp wheels that kind of they use like uh, there are these little straps that connect to the base of the harp. And the whole thing just fell off, and I just in that moment, no. like, oh. I felt so yeah. defeated in that moment. Like, oh mm-hmm. my god! And people are like swirling all around. People, there are just people it's trying to make their way around me. It's just a mess. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but glad I got that out of the way. Yeah. Well, you know? So back to your writing. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you write lyrics? I don't know how to write lyrics. I guess I do, but um, where do your lyrics come from? There's a lot. I was looking at. You sent me some of your lyrics, and I was like, yeah. this is so unique, and um, I wouldn't even say stream of consciousness, it's just a very mm-hmm. specific and, um, like, narrow uh, yeah. a description of an experience or an atmosphere. Um, I don't know. Where where does that come from? I don't know where it, where it comes from. That's a good question. <laughs> it's a really great question. Mm-hmm. I just... I... If I could kind of talk about the process, mm-hmm. there is, I'm kind of contending with different constraints. Because mm-hmm. there's the melodic constraint, there's the shape mm-hmm. of the melody that I'm supposed to sing, mm-hmm. um, and all the kind of emphases and all the kind of like, you have to take into account that it's that poetry is spoken and sung, mm-hmm. and that poetry has its root roots in oral tradition and in, in, in the tradition of memorizing. So there mm-hmm. has to be a shape. There has to be a shape that the words take that are memorizable, um, that are melodic, mm-hmm. and that sound good. Um, so I'm kind of contending with all these things. Sometimes I have a line that I really like, but it just doesn't work. It just mm-hmm. doesn't work melodically or sung. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I'm a huge fan of, like, Donald Fagan and Walter Becker, you know, mm-hmm. Steely Dan. And I remember hearing them talk about the process of writing lyrics and how a lot of the times it just comes down to the phoneme, the sound of the syllable itself. Mm-hmm. Like their song Peg, their huge hit song Peg, you know, wouldn't mm-hmm. really have worked if it was any other syllable sound, that chorus where they just say the woman's name. Peg! Mm-hmm. Right? It, it wouldn't really work if it was, like, Barb, or like yeah, I exactly. Know, like seventies lady's name, but yeah, you know, like uh, that <laughs> vowel sound is there's something about it. So you try to like yeah, try to kind of like I don't like to overthink the process so much because it's such an unconscious pro- process, mm-hmm. and kind of like this in its own way. Not I guess biological is a wrong word. But botanical isn't either. But all these mm-hmm. kinds of metaphors work with songwriting because mm-hmm. it, it's this kind of like you're growing this thing, this thing that's kind mm-hmm. of like exists in this kind of liminal state between yourself and the world beyond you. That it's sound and it's idea mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. but the lyrics and there's an objectivity to it. So it like sound is. Like there's particles, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, exactly. right. Um, you're affecting space and you're, you're affecting yeah. space and time itself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah through, you know, but the, uh, the lyrics, I, I like to, I like to have, you know, I think the way they start, if, if I can remember it properly mm-hmm. is that I'll have words that I like the sounds of and that are suggestive mm-hmm. and kind of catch your mm-hmm. ear. And then mm-hmm. what happens is, like, I'll try to... It's not a try. It's not that I try to. Mm-hmm. It's that um, kinds of uh, synchronicities occur. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, or, like, sy- synchronicities that I will observe that I'll try mm-hmm. to set in lyrics and find mm-hmm. rhymes for. Um, there's something almost kind of metaphysical to it without getting too hokey mm-hmm. and woo-woo. <laughs> There's almost something oh, like, yeah. okay, uh, you just have to trust. It's, it's liminal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a, you could say no, it's liminal. It's no, it is so true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, I always think about this uh, quote, or I don't know. I, I remember watching this interview with Fiona Apple. And she Uh said that what she does is she just walks around her house and says the same, like, sentences and tries and experiments with different, same syllable, but different (laughs) words and textures and verbiages and expressions. And that's kind of where her, um, similar to how you were describing, um, not necessarily matching the syllable with the melody and then that's it, but... Uh, more matching the texture of like a sil- the syllable with the texture because you could have like uh, the same cadence of a Fiona Apple song but if it has different verbiages different textures it doesn't hit the same you know um, and it's I really funny. I really like that yeah I was it's funny because I was thinking of bringing up Fiona Apple <laughs> just a moment ago when she uh, I, I can't quote it directly that's why I didn't bring it up but mm-hmm. she said something along the lines of there's something like beautiful about the idea that you know like these two words rhyme and it's almost like it was fate you know, there's something yeah. kind of like uh, almost predestined that you know these two lines mm-hmm. line up in this way you know that mm-hmm. a given two lines will work together and rhyme yeah. that, that there's something kind of fateful about it yeah um and uh, also I like to involve a sense of narrative, not in a mm-hmm. super developed way. You know, Newsom mm-hmm. is very narrative in many of her mm-hmm. lyrics um, and, and kind of literary in her lyrics. Mm-hmm. But I at least li- I at least like to develop a sense that there's some kind of through line through the lyrics. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I'm not so fond of for myself of writing stream of consciousness lyrics that's a little lazy to me yeah and my musical mind doesn't really exactly work in that way yeah it doesn't really lend itself to just because when i do that i i don't even really do that much when i <laughs> yeah because um, then when I you like, look at it you're like what 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 is it <laughs> what yeah, am i doing I like to, yeah i like to put things on a page and i like to yeah edit them. 
and I like mm-hmm. to see things take shape um, in kind of poetic forms. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, when you, like for this forthcoming album, when <laughs> you, you finish um, all these songs and you look back on kind of the body of work and the uh, track list, um, similar to how you're talking about like it's fate. Do you look back on it and you see something completely different than what you had like previously conceived, um, or do you feel like surprised by your own work, or you learn anything new? Yeah, I could. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I feel like many of the songs on the record address the same uh, the the same kind of situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe different feelings about the situations. Mm-hmm. But there is kind of I don't I don't like to be like a moralistic writer. I don't really like to mm-hmm. prescribe things in my lyrics. I don't really like to tell the listener what to do or what they should think. I like mm-hmm. to present the listener with a set a series of emotions or images and they're not always super literal. Uh, mm-hmm. I know the word is uh, impressionistic. I know mm-hmm. Pauline Kael has issues with the word impressionistic, mm-hmm. but I'll mm-hmm. use it. Um, I know mm-hmm. that's kind of how Newsom describes her own lyrics is kind of, mm-hmm. or at least she describes in part their, their kind of impressionistic quality. There is mm-hmm. that element in my writing, but yeah, I don't really like to tell people um, what they should take away from the song or what they should take away from an image. I just like to present the image. Um, yeah. But there is kind of a cautionary tale, uh, or maybe just a cautionary ending to the mm-hmm. record. Because the record is 12 tracks, and I initially envisioned 10. And mm-hmm. the, the 10 tracks kind of cataloged these kind of very turbulent years in my life mm-hmm. um, that I had dedicated to music. And solely Mm -hmm. music, and I was kind of, you know, I I was very poor. Um, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I did what I can to to, to get by, but I was devoting a lot Mm -hmm. of my time to my craft, wholeheartedly Mm -hmm. just throwing myself into it and hoping that something would stick. Mm -hmm. And with the opening kind of, the opening tracks are kind of romantic Mm -hmm. towards intoxication Mm -hmm. and lyricism and all you know just just a kind of dionysian element Mm -hmm. of being creative aspiration like Mm -hmm. evoking the essence of yeah um something beyond hopeful yeah yeah and then this Mm -hmm. kind of more nightmarish quality Mm -hmm. begins to emerge on the record these kinds of caveats and pitfalls that the narrator or narrators uh, Mm -hmm. find themselves in. These kinds of like, well, they gave themselves, the narrator gave himself over to this experience and then there are all these little things that he didn't anticipate Mm -hmm. would come with Mm -hmm. that experience that are troubling or frightening Mm -hmm. or on the last track, um, well, it's... uh, there's an initial 10 songs that I wrote, and then there are two bonus tracks. And the, mm-hmm. the 12th track is, has, its, has a very special place. Um, but before I get there, the 10th track, which is called Mink, uh, mm-hmm. kind of the narrator settles everything down and kind of tells, mm-hmm. addresses the listener, telling, saying that, you know, that the show is over, that it's time mm-hmm. to be on the mend, and, like, mm-hmm. because there are all these nightmares that are happening. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a, th- th- that song was interesting to, to write because there's this moment um, where I was able to kind of set something lyrically that I don't mm-hmm. think works when you explain it. There, there are some things that only really, certain connections and I'll use the word again, synchronicities, that mm-hmm. only really work in the lyrical form. And it mm-hmm. happened, and I'll try to explain it, and I won't do it justice, and it won't mm-hmm. sound great. And it'll just be like, why did I waste, like, three minutes explaining this when I could have just left it as mm-hmm. is? And that's what I think the lyrics are for. But yeah. 
I was I was watching these different. <laughs> so I was watching these different translations <laughs> of Sailor Moon. <laughs> oh, and, okay. Yeah, I, I, was watch, I was watching these different dubs of Sailor Moon, which I grew up mm-hmm. with, and it was a it was a season four, which is the dreams arc, and the villains are trying to steal these like dream mirrors, which are parts of people's souls that contain their dreams and mm-hmm. Sailor Moon is, you know, protecting people's dreams. And the demons that are called forth to snatch people's dream mirrors are referred to as the, uh, the Lemures. Lemures is mm-hmm. an ancient Greek word that means like a restful, a, a restless house spirit. And that was mm-hmm. kind of the, uh, the, the subject matter that I was trying to talk about in the song. Mm-hmm. Well, in a certain translation of Sailor Moon, that gets translated as remless, the sleepless, what? the R-E-M-less. Oh, yeah, those yeah, without yeah. Art, Those without yeah. dreams, those without a dream. Yeah. Know. Uh, you know, I like so how the sleepless a, monster uh, entity <laughs> a lot yeah, better. Yeah. 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 So uh, there's just this kind of, like, strange, mm-hmm. separated by at least 2,000 years of history mm-hmm. between this ancient Greek word lemurus and this mm-hmm. this kind of neologism for an anime, the mm-hmm. remless. And it just yeah. kind of cemented something in my brain. And without explaining it too much, that was a kind of connection. I'm like, oh, that's perfect for lyrics. Mm-hmm. So that's the kind of thing I like to put in lyrics, these things that don't always work. Mm-hmm. Uh, these kind of realizations about your own life and your own mm-hmm. habits and and the kind of circles you run in your mind and the dream, the nightmares and dreams that, that you have over and over again. All those things, all the things that I was trying to say about that were concretized kind of in that moment. And then I just wrote all those lyrics, the lyrics wow. for track 10, which is called Make. Wow. Um, That's so beautiful. Thank I, you. um, have you, I mean, so how long did it take to put together, um, all, all of the songs um, for this most recent project. And G, and my main question is, what do you do when you have creative blocks when you feel like I'm trying to hit some kind of mark with this one project or this one song, but I'm not satisfied with it? And yeah, there's like this, un, there's this dissatisfaction that we get ourselves involved with when it comes to music and it's maybe it's about just repetition, but um, how how do you overcome that? Like, how long does that usually take to push through? Um, if I heard you correctly, because um, just a little bit of what you were saying got yeah. jumbled by the uh, by, okay. by the software that we're using. But um, okay. I heard the I heard the end of what you were saying. You were asking me yeah, about yeah. Kind of writer's blocks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I kind of how long it took me to write. Mm-hmm. Well, I started writing the record. I, and I started writing the material in 2018, and I kind of had the finished first draft of the entire thing uh, by late 2020. So by the end of 2020, mm-hmm. I had the 10 songs that I wanted. Mm-hmm. And there were all kinds of moments of blocks. There were mm-hmm. all kinds of moments of like, oh, I don't know where this song is going. And am I going to keep mm-hmm. this song? I think I wrote maybe 20 songs. I think I mm-hmm. wrote close to like 20, 25 different songs, whether they had mm-hmm. lyrics to them or they were kind of like instrumental things that I would play or little mm-hmm. loops that I came up with. I came up with more than 20 different ideas and mm-hmm. 10 of them made the cut. But mm-hmm. um, but there are, there are always moments of blocks. There are always moments of where I don't know where something is headed. Mm-hmm. But eventually, uh, eventually they work themselves out if they're salvageable mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and if they interest me enough. I wish I had advice about writer's block, but the only mm-hmm. thing I could really say is to keep going, you know? Yeah. I, uh, I really liked what you said about like, neologisms, translations, um, exploring like history um, and using uh, referencing mi- mixed media and uh, a different uh, languages and essences behind the languages. Um, usually when I'm frustrated or trying to articulate something that simply cannot, I cannot express, 
I always use the th uh, the thesaurus, <laughs> or yeah. Um, yeah, like l I just read books on linguistics, uh, oh, just different language language books, um, so many different languages I'm obsessed with, and so many different um, words that there's so many words that we don't have. Uh, it's almost like we don't we're with the different the thing about linguistics and like different languages and different cultures is that there's almost a separate world that and universe where we'll never um, be exposed to if we don't learn another word that we don't have in English. Like there's so many words uh, in like uh, Japanese and Russian uh, for certain uh, relationships and concepts that we don't have words for in English. And mm -hmm. I feel similar about the instruments that are from different cultures and different uh, times in history because it's a complete, like, uh, otherworldly. It, it's like, oh, this is a completely uh, different world that you're in. Like, when you hear those new some arrangements and you feel like, you are teleported into a completely new culture and time in history um, with a completely different decorum. Um, it's very, very special because, yeah, music is kind of what extends beyond what language can do. Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah, I think that's, like, very, very beautiful. Do you ever get um, okay. your harp... Do you ever get your harp... Uh, uh, Oh no! You said you tune you tune your own harp. I was wondering if um, you've ever rented in like earlier days if you ever rented a harp or because um, that's I used to do that with a cello. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah, I'm, 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 the cellos that I played as on mm -hmm. as a kid were rented. Yeah, I've never rented yeah. a harp. Mm -hmm. um, I've always owned my own harp. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I tune it myself, and I tune my harp mm -hmm. differently. Than mm -hmm. other harpists, uh, other harpists are a little uh, mm -hmm. bothered when I say that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why. It's only two strings that I tune. Uh, only yeah. two sets of strings that I tune differently. You know. Yeah. But, uh, for you know, it, yeah. and I've no, I've noticed where it. You know, I see somebody playing their harp in E flat major, and I play mine in D flat major. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and I see where issues arise if I was trying if I was going to try to replicate what they were doing, uh, yeah. but um, you know I've always just had my own heart and I kind of I do with it what I please. <laughs> yeah, when you listen to music, um, what's a genre of music that evokes the most inspiration in your songwriting process? Um, do you have any like uh, specific genres of music or languages? Um, I, love, I, I love music from the seventies. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I love. Um, I immediate. I don't know why, but immediately came to mind was like Shaka Khan. Like I love Rufus, that. <laughs> Rufus and Shaka Khan. Yeah. Um, but like Joni Mitchell, Joni Mitchell, yeah. Stevie Dan, mm -hmm. you know. To, uh, I don't know what it is about 70s songwriting that is just so I was saying it to my friend the other night um, how did they I was kind of just, I was like saying rhetorically out loud you know like yeah. how did they just know exactly what to do yeah. you know in a way that today's that many of t today's popular musicians can't seem to, to convey mm -hmm. there's something about whatever whatever they were snorting in the nineties. What were they on? Whatever education out, and whatever education they had, whatever habits as musicians that they kept, uh, you know, regarding their musicianships, mm -hmm. uh, it was just so alive. In it was the a different time, a different, different consciousness. <laughs> so, so bizarre to like. If you know, it, it's funny because it's just it, mm -hmm. to think that there's some progressive 
line throughout history that we're just getting mm-hmm. better and better. It's just, yeah, it's, just it's so not, not true. true. It's no, so not true. It's not they true. really knew what they were doing. No, like, it's really, um, it really <laughs> peaked in the seventies. I really yeah. lo- love seventies dance music. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's oh, the best. Oh my God. And yeah. the acoustic uh, sound quality from uh, the 70s has its own texture. Um, uh, yeah. And it doesn't feel so washed yeah. as much. Um, Have you ever listened to it just Judy feels Sill? Raw. No, I haven't. Have ever heard of Judy Sill? Judy Sill uh, was one of my. Uh, first huge inspirations when I started writing on the harp. Mm-hmm. But she was, a, she was a, a guitarist and a pianist in the early 70s, but she led a wild life. She kind mm-hmm. of ended up writing really beautiful, kind of Christian, kind of gospel-y inspired music. Um, but she did so from having learned the church organ. And the reason Mm -hmm. why she learned church organ was because she was in reform school, because Mm -hmm. when she was a teenager, she she ran away from home, took up with bandits, held up liquor stores and gun stores, was prostituting uh, to support a a daily heroin habit. She lived in the back of uh, of of like a Jeep with uh, sleeping in shifts, rotating with other people. Uh, and mm-hmm. she wrote a lot of her material in that she wrote, uh, she was first hired to write songs for the Turtles um, mm-hmm. in the late 60s. Mm-hmm. And uh, she struck a record. She was the first artist that David Geffen signed to his uh, Asylum record label. Oh my and gosh. She made two albums for him. She was, she was uh, very, she was this kind of Christian mystic. Uh, she was wow. bisexual. She was openly bisexual mm-hmm. at a time, at a time, which I appreciate because you know I feel mm-hmm. pretty bisexual, and I appreciate mm-hmm. her her kind of point of view. Yeah, she had yeah. this kind of religious point of view, um, and I don't. I, I really don't like Hegel, or the philosopher Hegel, mm-hmm. but she had this kind of dialectical view of, about the unions of opposites and all these kinds yeah. of things. She was attempting through her. Yeah, the spe- <laughs> spirit, uh, uh, phenomenology of the spirit. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, but in that. in a '70s way. <laughs> in a se- yeah, in an early yeah. '70s way. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. but she wrote the most phenomenal, just incredible. Based in like her her main influences were Ray Charles and Bach. And wow. um, she would write these kind of. She, she, there's like a song with um. There's a song called "The Lamb Ran Away with the Crown." from her first record Mm -hmm. and there's this kind of round at the end where the 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 vocals kind of it's the same line but it's another harmony starting up midway through the line singing the same line and it just kind of circles Mm -hmm. round around this beautiful way but uh judy Um, sill was uh, such a a huge influence on my early uh, uh on songs that are on this forthcoming record you know, but yeah. quite a few of them were inspired by Judy Sill. Then I kind of took, then I really delved into Joni Mitchell's entire mm-hmm. discography, uh, the entire like mm-hmm. Steely Dan discography. Um, yeah, uh, those have been yeah, the kind very, of reasons, very like, string heavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, well, yeah. The um, the gospel music and Christian music, uh, contemporary gospel and Christian music, adult Christian music, um, from the 70s, it always feels so uh, underserved and, like, very mm-hmm. underrated. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's so many incredible musical uh, influences from the 70s, and there were a lot of use, heavy use of strings. And... When I think about the harp, I almost think about you. For, I I forget that I kind of I always find myself no matter what genre of music I'm writing or experimenting with, I'm like oh, a harp just takes it to the next level. Like <laughs> it truly does. It like changes yeah. everything. Uh, even R and B music. Um, yeah. I remember yeah. in the like bling era. Mm-hmm. 
everybody was using strings in, yeah. I mean, in, in the 90s as well. Mm-hmm. There was just strings in uh, rap and R&B music. Yeah. But there was harp. There was harp. There was harp. <laughs> there was harp. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the boy yeah. is mine. Yes. Uh, oh, my gosh. I mean, even though that's a synthesizer, uh, it's like a, not a real harp, but that's a harp yeah. sound. Yeah. Exactly, uh, like so many like, of, you know, like songs exactly like that. You forget are basically meant to be and evoke a harp, a harp sound. Yeah. Oh, I mm-hmm. forgot to say, I'm obsessed with like uh, Mariah Carey's like the production that's on her records. Oh yeah! Uh, shout I mean, out to the was, Lambs. I know. Shout out to the Lambs. <laughs> shout out to the Lambs. <laughs> <laughs> but no, oh, Mariah boy. Carey, uh, her voice. But also her writer, her writerly voice, because I know she mm-hmm. has a hand. She plays a part in the in the uh, in the writing oh, yeah. of the songs, and you can hear yeah. it too. I hear her, I hear her voice as a writer in the, in her mm-hmm. in her music, and I yes, find it yeah. so uh, so inspired. It's inspired. Um, mm-hmm. There's I didn't send it to you, but there's a song called. Um, it's a fifth track on the record. It's called Before Land, and that mm-hmm. is a. Uh, that was totally inspired by mm-hmm. what her recent album caution by the track mm-hmm. giving me life which mm-hmm. is just such a kind of spooky and sensual track mm-hmm. and um i kind of when i heard that i started writing a song that was kind of mm-hmm. uh, inspired by it yeah yeah so mm-hmm. mariah too mariah. mariah's writing and and the production on all of her albums I definitely would describe her style as very sensual, spiritual, but also spooky. Um, yeah. Because, like, she just, you can tell when you listen to her lyrics, it is so accessible, but there's also something there where you know there's it's completely exclusive. Quality. Yes, and it's exclusive oh, to her it. style <laughs> and her mind, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. It's, like, well, very, yeah. like, astronomical, <laughs> like, galaxy... Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, because there's a preserved... I'm not saying, you know, because... Uh, I'm not saying it sounds exactly like this, but I, I remember seeing somebody uh, comment on... Like, for example, the, uh, the track from uh, her album Daydream, it's called Underneath the Stars. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's just such lush, beautiful dreamy instrumentation on it and I remember seeing like a YouTube comment saying of all the like vocal divas, of all the vocal Mm -hmm. athletes of the 1990s you know, you don't hear these kinds of Mm -hmm. arrangements on Celine Dion love Celine Dion Mm -hmm. love Celine, yeah yeah, yeah. love, revere Mm -hmm. Celine Dion revere, Revere. yeah (laughs) but you don't don't get that on Whitney you don't get it in Celine Mm -hmm. You, you know, these kind of these lush instruments, it, it harkens mm-hmm. back to Minnie Ripperton, to mm-hmm. Loving You, to, mm-hmm. uh, to, you know, Minnie Ripperton who did those, mm-hmm. those whist- the, the, you know, the, one of the OGs of recorded mm-hmm. whistle notes mm-hmm. um, of, uh, I, I'm going to misname the track, Come Inside My Love, of Memory Lane, all these mm-hmm. songs. All these beautiful seventies, all this beautiful seventies production, mm-hmm. and you know, kind of Minnie Ripperton's vision that, mm-hmm. that came alive in her music. Mm-hmm. That's alive in Mariah. I'm not saying Mariah it is. does it exactly the way she does, mm-hmm. but it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. She music. preserves it. The mm-hmm. just yeah, the arrangements and the the world you're skyrocketed into. It's kind of. Um, it's trying to achieve sort of the the goal or the conclusion to the dream of mm-hmm. the time that <laughs> was, it was inspired by. Um, yeah, it is very beautiful. I think Mariah Carey is the only like musician who I ever cried to, but out of mm-hmm. not out of because I was sad, mostly because I was just overcome with emotion. I, I forget what song it was. Yeah, what what song was it? It was just like one of the can, like canonized songs, like yeah, We Belong yeah. Together or uh-huh. um, Oh, of course. Fantasy. Those, those, yeah. those songs have such power. And mm-hmm. I've been, you know, there have been moments where I've been really overwhelmed and overcome by by yeah. music. There's a there's a there's a piano version 
it's like her her studio vocals over somebody's mm-hmm. like piano interpretation mm-hmm. of the last song on Butterfly, which is called Outside. Mm-hmm. And th- there was a time last spring where I really wasn't sure where my life was headed, and I was really kind mm-hmm. of feeling out of sorts and, mm-hmm. and honestly scared for the future. I would just kind mm-hmm. of go on, you know, one of those Lindy walks listening to Yeah, that gotta do it. And it was such a support. <laughs> It was such a support. Yeah. It was just, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It was like nutritious. It was like it was mm-hmm. sustenance. There's sustenance in that music. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah. It, it keeps you going. I, I think I'm always listening to R&B music. I don't know what it is about R&B music, but it just makes me feel calm, contemplative, mm-hmm. but also romantic and hopeful yeah. at the same time. That's I sort think of it, the, yeah. it's a dreamy quality, yeah. I think it has to do with its roots in religious music, you know? Yeah, it's, it's true. It's so true. Gospel you know? Yeah. That is, yeah. I, that is very apt. Um, well, my question is, what kind of uh, songs are your favorite to cover on the harp? Oh, <laughs> that's really interesting. That's an interesting question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. I have a hard time answering that because mm-hmm. I've tried to cover so many different kinds of songs on the harp. But yeah. I like songs that challenge the notion of what you would hear on a harp. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, songs that kind of pushed the harp out of its comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe just kind of, yeah, playing with what you would expect to hear on a harp. But, like,. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a good question. I was trying, there's a song called um, "The Devil Is Loose." It's a song mm-hmm. from the seventies by Asha Putli. She's mm-hmm. a singer from Bombay. Um, mm-hmm. But I was trying to do that last spring. I remember I did an arrangement of that, and it's just a bit, it's again, it's just these kinds of very soulful things. It's these kind of soulful, mm-hmm. beautiful seventies yeah. kinds of things that inspire me, or also nineties. Like kind of '90s vibes, hip hop and R&B from the '90s and uh, yeah. 2000s. You know, fucking um, Ja Rules. Uh, mm-hmm. What's that song um, with Ashanti? Uh, uh, the name is escaping me right now, but it has mm-hmm. such a buoyant kind of like. There's something about there's something about pulling mm-hmm. on the string. I've heard a harpist describe. I, I, this harpist on YouTube, uh, her name is uh, Chiara Pedrazetti, and mm-hmm. she talks about she talked about uh, a week that she spent away from her harp, and she talked about the thing that she missed most was not like really sitting down and practicing or the or the kind of uh, uh, the, the the repertoire or anything, but it was just the act itself of mm-hmm. sitting down and pulling pulling mm-hmm. on the strings. That that mm-hmm. if a song gives me that sensation that I really want to mm-hmm. pull the, that song out of the strings and really mm-hmm. the physicality of playing on the mm-hmm. harp, that's how I know I want to do that yeah. song. There's no I, other uh, way to describe it. I can always hear when the strings are like pulled. I can whenever I listen to a harp mm-hmm. like song, um, I can always uh, see the hands in my mind's eye. Like yeah, somebody right. like really ripping at it, yeah. um, and it's very totally. visceral. Like any like the harp is so visceral when you listen to it because it's just pure yeah. reverberation in your face. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, didn't you post like a trap uh, arrangement or something? You did something like with trap music. I saw. Oh. Well, you know, my original name on Instagram was Trap Harp back in, like, 2016. Oh, 20, okay. 2017, I was known as Trap Harp on yeah. Instagram. But I played, I think I played, um, it was, like, the Usher P. Diddy song. Yeah, um, I think so. It's called I, I Need a Girl, but it was recently yeah. sampled by Ice Spice. So mm. I was kind of doing that. Um, yeah. And I've done you, other things. You too. are the you are like the um, you are ice spice, the, the harp ice spice. <laughs> Thank you. That's <laughs> yeah. a big compliment. Thank you. You know, we went to the same college, not at the same time, but we went to the same college. Yeah. 
What did she? Okay, so you went to purchase for yeah, I went to um for, for um, <laughs> so yeah. What got you? What was that about? Did you do you like philosophy? I used to. You like you like um, reading. <laughs> I used to. I used to really. Yeah. I, you know, I I love um, my favorite philosopher was uh, Spinoza. The mm-hmm. oh my gosh, and, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, mm-hmm. I love Spinoza. I still do. I love mm-hmm. Nietzsche, and mm-hmm. still like philosophers that I still love. Love Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. I really want to get into reading Kierkegaard because I really like mm-hmm. his kind of because I really don't like Hegel. And I don't yeah. think I don't think about I don't like to think of philosophy in terms of what I like and don't like, even though I think that's maybe that yeah. might be a useful rubric, but I don't know. But I'm not crazy yeah. about Hegel, <laughs> and I like Kierkegaard's kind of rebuttal that it's you know in life there isn't going to be this reconciliation of both sides. You have to make a choice. There have to be yeah. choices that are made that exclude mm-hmm. certain things. And I like that's that about true. Kierkegaard. Yeah, um, and, and I I love Camille Paglia. I love. I see her mm-hmm. as a kind of of com- continuing in the line of these the singers. grand dom. The grand dom. I know the grand yeah. dom. I love Camille yeah. Paglia as she follows, um, kind of in this line from Spinoza to Nietzsche to Freud, mm-hmm. um, and Saad, as they're all kind mm-hmm. of thinkers of the human drives. These gnarly mm-hmm. human drives that kind of upend our notions that we are the complete authors of all our actions, that mm-hmm. um, somehow, that kind of upend our idea that at the heart of everything there's our subjectivity mm-hmm. that kind of dictates yeah. our action and that uh, mm-hmm. we know exactly what we're doing all the time. Um, mm-hmm. I hope that doesn't come across as a naive depiction, uh, but... No, I, uh, I, I really... Yeah, I, I really love Spinoza so much, and I feel like Spinoza yeah. is so not talked about enough because um, people need more Spinoza only because he has such a <laughs> unique approach to joy, yeah. you know? Yeah. And the drive yeah. towards joy and the need for joy, it's very yeah. poetic. Um, yeah, well, he viewed joy as the pinnacle of life itself. You know? Yeah. And it's kind it's, of the yeah. utmost expression of our activity, as the kind of yeah. pinnacle of our activity is to uh, is to be expressed through joy. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, with that said, are you going to play something <laughs> for us today? Oh, or you oh. don't have to. I can splice something in. <laughs> well, um... You... I, can put, I can put something in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was hoping to talk a little bit about those, um, a couple of those little pieces I, I sent your way. We don't have to, but oh, I just want to talk please, about, like, maybe do. a minute or two about yes. what I loved about each mm-hmm. moment of harp that I kind of sent you. you can, maybe you can edit them in after. But, um, yes, yes, yes. All right, so. Um, examples. But okay. one more thing. I also wanted to answer one question you had earlier. Yes. Uh, and it was just about whether I saw a kind of uh, a kind of uh, shape in relief in retrospect when I look at my record. And uh, mm-hmm. when I was trying to say that, I'm, I'm not trying to impart any kind of like moral of the story or anything. Mm-hmm. But that there was a there's a bit of a cautionary tale because what begins in this kind of love letter as this kind of love letter with some kind of hesitance on behalf of the, the narrator, mm-hmm. this kind of love letter to, to going into like these Dionysian drives to like this kind of like mm-hmm. intoxication and being a vessel for the music, mm-hmm. all these things, right? Kind yeah. of the last, the very last song is a song that's dedicated to my friend, to a friend of mine, uh, named mm-hmm. Trevor, uh, who passed away um, in late 2021. Mm-hmm. His death was publicized quite a bit. Um, but I, I, just, read a, I read about this. Yeah. Yeah, very, Trevor. Bethel, very sad. I know. He was, he was a friend of mine. Um, I'd just seen him two nights before he passed. Um, and I, it, was, it was just, it, it, I still struggle for words. 
to kind of yeah. describe what, what it what that blow was like. But in the mm-hmm. moment, I remember it felt like somebody literally, literally, like almost like with a scalpel and like mm-hmm. sliced a piece of my heart away. Mm-hmm. And I just I wanted to. I immediately kind of took to music um, because I had no other way to really console myself. I remember putting on, I remember I was on my way to the fucking nail salon. I was just going to get a mani pedi that day when I was on the bus. I was on the bus and I got the news and I was, I immediately went into denial. I'm like, no, this is a Mm -hmm. joke. Like, this can't be. Mm -hmm. This can't be. And then it set in and immediately was the bargaining element, which was like, oh my God, what do I what can I do to bring him back? Like, mm-hmm. as if that was yeah. even a possibility, but that's where the mind goes. It's like, yeah. all right, there's something to be done. I can, I could get him back. Yeah. Right? But like, no. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I remember he, he, his favorite musician was Charles Mingus. And on my walk back from the nail salon, I was just like, so sullen and teary eyed and mm-hmm. like was trying to put together the, the loss of that. I couldn't even rationalize it in any way, but I put mm-hmm. on Johnny Mitchell's album with Mingus that also had to do with the death of Mingus. Um, but I remember in the next couple of days, there was this piece of music that I'd had uh, kind of forming uh, the prior couple of months. Um, and that's when me and Trevor were hanging out a lot. And mm-hmm. he was doing a lot of the work towards um, NPCC, uh, the film mm-hmm. festival that he had worked with that had like John mm-hmm. Waters and the Red Scare Girls mm-hmm. and all that. Um, I remember he wanted me to play harp for this play that he'd written, but it never, that somehow didn't pan out, Mm -hmm. but I had this piece of music and I remember going to Central Park. I I had to, I took some weed over to somebody I knew Mm -hmm. by, by, by Central Park. And after, after that, I went into the park and I just wrote down all my feelings and they started Mm -hmm. assembling into little verses. And that's what became that song. So when I look at that album, I see this kind of progression with this kind of caution at the end, which, mm-hmm. interestingly enough, um, that was kind of Spinoza's, uh, how Spinoza would seal his letters with the, the Latin mm-hmm. word for caution, which I, I actually wow. have a tattoo of it. <laughs> it was my first tattoo. Wow. <laughs> you know, nerdily enough, but this tattoo... It comes full circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, strangely. I don't know how I could... Uh, ah! You, you yeah, almost yeah, yeah. That that is his seal. Yeah. That is a wax seal, wow. um, and it has the Latin word for caution. But you wow. know, it means to kind of take care, to take care of mm-hmm. things. And, um, the, the, and the, what, it was, what was the song? To, what was the song called? What was the name? Oh, the, the name is. Just, it's just named after him. It's just called. Oh, it's called Trevor okay. Forever. It's called Trevor Forever. Oh, okay. Okay. And That's um, beautiful. yeah, thanks, thanks. But I just wanted to point that out. That um, yes. To pay tribute to my dear friend Trevor Bazil, who's a friend to him. Mm-hmm. He, uh, quite a few people I know were friends with mm-hmm. him. I really loved him and adored him. And he was such mm-hmm. a brilliant musician, jazz musician, so mm-hmm. talented, operatic singer. He played saxophone. He had a whole mm-hmm. vision of music, but his life was cut short because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for reasons <sighs> that I had romanticized on my album. Yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't present one side of the story without kind of adding this kind of counterweight. Um, Mm -hmm. But I wanted to make sure that I addressed that. Yes, of course. We could move on to a a, a kind of maybe a lighter note. Um, Yes, absolutely. Well, let's go through these. these, um, Yeah. Yeah, let's go through these um, uh, three songs that you sent. Um, Yeah. Starting with the first one. Um, Let's see. What was the... First one called. I have it written down here. Let's start with um. Let's start with John R. by Dorothy Ashby. Um. Cool. Oh yeah, here it is. John R. by Dorothy. I'll just speak on it. Yeah. Um. There's a really fantastic sound that happens on the pedal harp when you, when you're playing on the strings and you kind of disengage the, uh, the, the, like, sharpening the, the disc. There are discs mm-hmm. um, in, in the, the neck of, the kind of, like, neck of the heart mm-hmm. where all the strings come down from. There are all these little rotating discs that are activated 
by rods in the calm of the harp, which you mm-hmm. manipulate with the pedals at the base of the pedal harp. And these kind of control what key you're in. Um, mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you play them with some intention, you can incorporate that sound of the string either flattening or sharpening, mm-hmm. you know, into your music. And, you know, those, those kind oh. of uh, incorporated as, like, grace notes. There's just, like, a really yeah. quick... But they're felt. It's kind of this, like, mm-hmm. upward pinch or mm-hmm. this, like, downward kind of, like, like drop. This you twang. Kind of, yeah, it's, yeah. like, kind of like a twangy sound. Yeah. You hear it at the end of um, You and Me Best by Joanna Newsom. Mm-hmm. There's, like, the, the kind of song ends on this kind of, like, use of the pedals. Um, it sounds really bluesy. Yeah. Um, but Dorothy... Yeah, I think you mentioned, like, the buoyancy in it. As well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. And I love that about quite a, f- uh, the, a couple of these tracks that we're going to be talking about. But um, mm-hmm. there's like a buoyancy to the heart. There's just something so bouncy and bubbly about it. Mm-hmm. But the, this track, John R. from her self titled, I believe it came out in 1962, it's her self titled record, Dorothy Ashby, um, which mm-hmm. is a lot of bebop harp with like a you know full backing band. And um, there's something so exciting about this track, but it, the, the way that you could hear the, the, the pedals being used um, to give it this mm-hmm. kind of, like, bluesy sound, this kind of, like, really jazzy sound, that's one of my mm-hmm. favorite things to hear on a harp, you know? Yeah. yeah. I like, um, whenever I listen to a harp, I, I love those, like, sounds that are... You don't you don't think you have a certain like sound everybody uh, thinks about in their mind's ear mm-hmm. when they think about the harp, um, but there's um, this whole other world to uh, the sound that you can uh, evoke from the harp that people right. just don't know about and uh, right. many people don't even practice anymore um, yeah, yeah. or teach. Um, yeah. You know, there are things yeah. about the mechanism. The, the, you know, the pedal harp itself is a machine. Mm-hmm. It's, there's a mechanism yeah. inside mm-hmm. that. Uh, that's why it's so expensive to buy a pedal harp. But yeah. you know, the pedals activate these rods that correspond to all these discs that meet mm-hmm. the string at a certain point, and that f- that mm-hmm. change the pitch of the string. But you can hear that mm-hmm. happen. You know, if, if you're not muting the strings as a harpist, mm-hmm. um, and you let those ring out, those are really cool, really cool little grace mm-hmm. notes that you could, uh, mm-hmm. you could involve those in your music, you know. Mm-hmm. A lot of jazz harpists do it, and I, I mm-hmm. love that so much. It's my favorite sound on the harp. I do it with my lo- with my lover harp, too, you know. Kind of yeah. Like, do this, like, uh, mm-hmm. that kind of sound. For some reason, you know, you just don't expect it out of a harp. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And to hear this kind of like press on, like as if you're pressing on mm-hmm. to a string on a guitar, it's a lot mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, did you want to talk about uh, Romanian folk yes. dances? <laughs> yeah. So when I really was starting to take the harp seriously, more seriously in 2016, I encountered. Mm-hmm. Uh, these uh, recordings by O'Shawn Ellis, who's kind of like a harp superstar. Though I don't know too much about him, but he had a lot of harp recordings in the f- uh, 50s and 60s. Um, but these recordings of Bartok's Romanian folk dances are just its some of my f- most favorite classical music. Mm-hmm. And the kind of polka... The, 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 there are like six parts to the Romanian folk dances in parts mm-hmm. five and six are just the most kind of bombastic to me. Um, mm-hmm. And they're so expressive. And another, the, the word buoyant comes up. Mm-hmm. There's a buoyancy to it. It's mm-hmm. just the sounds of like rushing and like... Yeah. And these, this, as if this swarm of na- just like natural things is like mm-hmm. rushing around the listener. I don't really know how to explain it, but I'm sure if you include the clip of it, the listeners mm-hmm. can hear what I'm talking about. There's just... yeah. It kind of was the syncretization of all these things that I'd wanted to hear on Harp that I'd kind of gotten, that I'd heard through Newsom and through Ashby, mm-hmm. but I'd uh, never heard it really in classical Harp. And just to hear it mm-hmm. in this kind of, in its most full expression, it was just so exciting. Um, and there's mm-hmm. no real way to put it, but I just wanted to present that um, as just kind of an exciting example of Harp music to the listeners. Yeah. And then... 
Well, well, here's a question, actually. Yeah. I. Well, what's the biggest misunderstanding about folk music as like this big umbrella term, um, and like folk dance music, like uh, folk um, like storytelling? What um, what do you feel like? How should how do we define folk music? That's my question, I guess. That's funny. Somebody was doing this. Um, somebody was defining folk music um, mm-hmm. on my Hamburger Helpless page, on my meme page, because mm-hmm. I posted, I, there was a Joanna Newsom post. I occasionally do mm-hmm. these little posts in tribute to her mm-hmm. music. Um, I usually come, sometimes combine them with memes and stuff that somebody was talking about. Uh, what Newsom does in a way to, uh, she, she plays with folk music, but she's also the artist. Um, you know, mm-hmm. which kind of pushes against the notion of folk music, which is for the people, yeah. which is used to yeah. voice community, you know, kind of community. Mm-hmm. Um, communal it's, like, ideas. it's for a utility, like a need. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 What is folk music? I don't know. I mean, yeah. I kind of know, but I don't, I don't want to yeah. say it, no. Um, no. I mean, folk music has an element of accessibility to it, mm-hmm. to, to people who it's can It's for the folks. It. It's for the folks, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Not necessarily the folks like with the X, but you know the F O. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's for the classic F O L K S. Yes. It's for yeah. it's for the yeah it's for the folks. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, um, did, did, what was the third third one? The last was um, this little section in oh, Sada. Your, uh, oh, yeah. really? That- the Bjork track? Oh, no, no. Sawdust. No, no, no. Sawdust and Diamonds. No, you're right. I just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> though, though Bjork's Vesper team, though, I was considering mm-hmm. yeah. something from Bjork's Vesper team, but I couldn't really uh, decide on something. But I wanted to use an example of Newsom's mm-hmm. playing that I found so kind of virtuosic or like... There's this thing that she does in Sawdust and Diamonds, uh, the, the way that the... the the harp corresponds to the lyrics. Um, mm-hmm. And I've, I'd seen her kind of allude to in interviews around the time of East. She was like, um, because East is a reference to the, the mythical city uh, off the coast of France, this mythical mm-hmm. city on an island that sank into the sea. Um, mm-hmm. That on certain nights, this is, uh, this is the folklore around it, that you could hear the bells of the mm-hmm. church bells. Um, on mm-hmm. you know quiet summer nights, you could hear the church bells of the mythical city mm-hmm. East in the distance. Mm-hmm. And Newsom said that, uh, like, had said in an interview that you could hear that at a certain spot on the album. Um, you know, there, there, there's, a, there, there's a at the end of Emily, there, there's a bell sound. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the middle of Only Skin, there is a moment that is kind of alluding to the flooding of this mythical city. Mm-hmm. But right in the kind of, uh, kind of sm- almost smack dab in the middle of Sawdust mm-hmm. and Diamonds, mm-hmm. there's this moment where the narrator of the song is talking about being out to sea for seven mm-hmm. days. And she opens the song by talking about, like, kind of, she's trying to mute out this bell that's in her ears. She can't mm-hmm. get rid of the sound, so she drops the bell off of the dock and lets it sink. And then, what, seven days later, the sound reoccurs, and all of a yeah. sudden on the harp, the, while she's playing this pretty busy mm-hmm. rhythmic f- figure on the harp, um, it's kind of like a bisbigliando, which is... Uh, mm-hmm. This kind of thing that you can do on harp. Um, and oh, what, wait, <laughs> what is it? What does that mean? What's the uh, translation? It's, like, it's kind of like, like this. It's kind of like a. It's kind of like a. Uh, what, what, what am I? That's what she's playing. So that's an example of this big Leando. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, 
So on top of that, she starts playing this thing, and it's supposed to be evocative of the bell. Mm -hmm. And I'm about... I, I could very <laughs> butcher this right now, but um, I at least provided the example so people can hear yeah. how it's played. But she adds this thumb. The thumb on the right hand starts moving around in a way that's so rhythmically unexpected. So let me try to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so shoddily yeah. done. But it's no, I, I know exactly, yeah, what you're talking about. Yeah, I, it's uh, that melody on the yeah. top that's evocative yes. of this bell. And to just throw yeah. that in to this 10-minute mm -hmm. long song that's already so rhythmically complex and lyrically yeah. dense, and to just throw that on top there to evoke yeah. the, the, the bell and to... to cry out over it she cries mm -hmm. uh you know it is that damnable bell and it tolls yeah. well, i believe that it tolls for me and it tolls for yeah. me and it's such a dissonant moment it's not you know um, to most ears hearing that they would wince i still wince yeah. kind of when i hear that section because yeah. the vocals really clash with the beauty mm -hmm. of the harp and i think what she's doing vocally is beautiful but it's not mm -hmm. conventionally beautiful mm -hmm. it's in a felt sense, beautiful because it pierces mm -hmm. the soul. It cries out to the soul, and it pierces the soul. And um, you know, if it catches you off guard, you know that, that's really like a gut punch in the song. Yeah, yeah. I those yeah exactly those gut punching moments in her music <laughs> where I wouldn't. I just have I have memories of like listening to her music, and there are these gut punching moments uh, yeah. in the stories she tells where. Uh, I'm very much cut off guard, and I actually have to turn um, the volume down because uh, there's the stress that uh, you know evoked from the, her music um, in some of her songs. Where <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know the this instrument, and, like these kinds of um, the genre of music could uh, evoke stress in me, <laughs> you know, or like pier pierce me in like in this way. Um, it's it's very very unique, um, yeah, and very dynamic. I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but do you is there a, is there, is there a song of hers that you just love, or is that that affects you in that way? That you oh can my gosh! Um, Not wait, to put hold you on. on. Let me uh, just no no no. Let me look up um, because yeah. bridges and balloons is like mm -hmm. one of my all time favorites. Um, that one is uh, crazy on the heart. That is such a crazy polyrhythm. I learned it recently, and it took me mm -hmm. a couple weeks to really get down pat. And it's not easy to play. It's an amazing. Yeah, watch. I think. Uh, okay, the Book of Right On <laughs> is definitely oh, yeah. um, like that was the. I think that was the first um, Joanna Newsome song that I ever listened to. That was the first um, one I really got into as well. Yeah. I think I heard Peach Plum Pear first, but then I heard mm -hmm. Book of Right On, and I'm like, oh, my God. Even though I was totally kind of, mm -hmm. like, taken aback and not ready for it, that mm -hmm. song was just such a banger from the jump. From the jump. Okay. Um, just so, and that, that was the one, yeah, where it was the first one, and it confused me, it intimidated me, it yeah. astonished me. Um, and the lyrics are another... The lyrics are so cunty. The like they are. They really are. <laughs> like, um, and even when you touch my face, you know your place. Or uh, yes, lines about um, ah, what is it? It's in the second verse. Do you want to run with my pack? Do you want to ride on? Yes. My oh my gosh. Pray that what oh you my lack gosh. does not distract. Ah. I mean, I think that I think you put it like so well. Like those are the most hunty lyrics I've ever <laughs> heard. Even um, when you run through my mind, something's always yeah. in front and you're behind. Yes. Like fuck. <laughs> <What> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, let's see. Say yeah, bridges and the bridges and balloons. Sadie. Um, sure. For sure. And then, you told me you had a. I remember you said once to me on Instagram. You said you you mm -hmm. had a strong uh, attachment to East when you were in high school. Yeah, East. Like record. I remember listening to East. What was the 
Oh, what was the song I was obsessed with? Um, I'm looking at it right now. What's the track list? Here, I kept it. So, kept so well, Sawdust and Diamonds, yeah. and um, it was... Uh, like Emily? Or like Cosmia? Emily, yeah. yeah. Cosmia, probably the... The all like my favorite one on yeah. the accordion, that. the accordion yeah. <laughs> like, on that when she's like yeah. that song is about her friend, um, a childhood friend who died in a car mm-hmm. car wreck when she was mm-hmm. on her first tour, and you just hear mm-hmm. it's, it's just so gripping, and mm-hmm. the, there's this gorgeous, gorgeous accordion that kind of sweeps in when she's kind of mourning. This song's like, can you hear me? Will you listen? Don't come mm-hmm. near me. Don't go missing. All the, the kind of mixed up feelings of grief mm-hmm. and this lovely accordion accompanying yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but anyway. And then what was the one that I was also obsessed with? I think it was, yeah. I loved um, also uh, Clam Crab Cockle Calorie. Oh, sure. That's a banger. Yeah. That's a beautiful ending song for her first record. And there's mm-hmm. a performance of it on Jules Holland from 2007 that's just so beautiful. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend. Um, I hope we haven't gone on too long. Uh, oh, no. No? These, Can I these say go one on. Can Please, I say one? yes. I wanted to talk about the title track of her, th- of Have One On Me, of the third mm-hmm. track. Of the third album, oh, yeah. Triple LP, just because um, as long as we're talking about harp um, and the kind of harp that's really marked me, um, see, I wanted to include that bit about Sawdust and Diamonds because I just think it's mm-hmm. just so exemplary. But I think her kind of masterwork um, in terms of harp composition is mm-hmm. on the title track, is on Have One On Me. Mm-hmm. Because you have, and it's this perfect syncing, this kind of synchronizing of lyrical content with musical content um Mm -hmm. there's this theme if you don't know the song uh the song takes place she's described the song as kind of taking place in the mind of its narrator but the narrator isn't well so the narrator Mm -hmm. is going from a state of lucidity to a state of hallucination the narrator is on her deathbed and is trying to reflect on her life, um, but is going back and forth from a more hallucinatory vision to one that's more lucid and just kind of oscillating between that. And as it turns Mm -hmm. out, the narrator is Lola Montez, which was the Mm -hmm. pseudonym of um, the Countess of Bavaria, or the Countess of Mm -hmm. Lansfeld, um, who, she was a courtesan uh, in the late 1800s who had an affair with uh, King Louis the Second, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. in an affair with King Louis the Second of Bavaria, um, mm-hmm. and caused some kind of political drama in the courts, and fled, um, as Newsom mm-hmm. states in the song, to save face in her career, and she ends mm-hmm. up in Grass Valley, California. In, mm-hmm. at the turn of the century where Newsom grew up. There's a little mountain. Mm-hmm. I, I remember reading in an interview, there's a little mountain named Mount Lola uh, that mm-hmm. is named after Lola Montez. And Newsom writes this song in allusion to, as a kind of way to think about her own role as a female performer. Um, mm-hmm. And what uh, this woman had fled to California to do, she became the first burlesque dancer. And mm-hmm. she, her, her dance involved shaking these little plastic spiders out of her skirts. Mm-hmm. And um, the, this theme of the spider recurs throughout the song. But I, when she plays these gorgeous rolled chords in the intro and outro of the song, it just reminds me of like a spider weaving its web. Mm-hmm. And I remember my friend uh, Kiko asked me, why do you think she's using the spider metaphor so much in the songs about creativity? And I'd never thought about that before because a spider does create its web and a a spider is kind of symbolic of creativity. But it's also this allusion to the uh, this burlesque dancer who used little plastic spiders in her burlesque dance. And it's mm-hmm. also about kind of fear. And like, right, there's that line, there's a big black spider hanging over my door, can't go anywhere anymore. Mm-hmm. And um, 
I love uh, this uh, section here. Uh, she says, it was dark, I was drunk and half dead, and we slept, knocking heads, sitting up in the star, smoking air, knocking heads like buoys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That whole, that whole, it's part of that whole kind of bridge section mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that kind of spins out of control, and mm-hmm. all the instruments are warring for control, for rhythmic control over mm-hmm. the song. On a purely musical level, there is mm-hmm. just this battle between the drums that are kind of thumping the harp that is kind of percolating in its own way and doing these kinds of like syncopated rhythms and then just this like dreamy kind of like flowy instrumentation in the horns and the strings and the recorder flutes, mm-hmm. the caval. Um, the, everything is kind of at, during those moments just like fighting for dominance over the song until it just gives gives way into mayhem, into this kind of wordless mm-hmm. melody that just literally sounds like insanity. And um, that's kind of, to me, the narrator in the song kind of losing grips with reality and mm-hmm. on, on our deathbed. And spir- it's spiraling out of control, spiral. Spiral, spiraling. spiral that, of a... Oh, spider's web. The spider's web, right? It's just so <laughs> potent. It's just the imagery is just so there. And the line that always jumps out at me is the line that goes, um, and in your kindness, you put me straight away in the cupboard with a bottle of champagne. And then later on the train, it was dark out. I was half dead. I saw a star fall into the sky like a chunk of thrown coal, as if God himself spat like a cornered rat. I really want you to do this for me. Will you have one on me? Like I, I was just uh, looking at that section. I was like, that's probably my favorite part of the song. <laughs> Incredible, yeah. incredible Just stuff. Very beautiful. And uh-huh. lastly, before before I wrap talking about this song up, there is the line. There is just such a, a banger moment that goes on. At night, I walk in the park with a whip between the lines of the whispering Jesuits who are poisoning you against me. And, sh- and that is an allusion to um, the, the, the Jesuits in the court of the King of Bavaria who were conspiring against Lola Manta, against, uh, against the, the narrator of the song. So it is based in, in a kind of historical reality, but it's put so beautifully, poetically, mm-hmm. um, and that moment is so gripping. Uh, yeah. oh, anyway. So good. Well, this, <laughs> this whole conversation, like, I, I have to... Now I'm, I am, like, inspired to go back and comb through every single <laughs> oh, um, some song now. I love that. I'm so excited. Well, Great. thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can we find you? Let's plug. Where course, can we find yes. our music? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So you can find me on Instagram um, at hamburger.helpless, or you mm-hmm. can find my smaller uh, harp dedicated page. I post harp on both pages. You could also find me at hamburger.harpist. Um, mm-hmm. I was supposed to plug a GoFundMe today because I really need to get this record mixed and mastered, but it's a very expensive mm-hmm. process and I'm pretty broke mm-hmm. right now. So, um, but Good I was things told, take time. <laughs> truly, truly. Yes. So I will have a, I will have a, a, a kind of crowdfunding link for the project soon, but for mm-hmm. anybody interested, you could hit me up um, on Venmo or Cash App. It's just my name. It's at Eric Dose, uh, D- mm-hmm. uh, E-R-I-C-D-O-C-E, or on the Cash App, it's a little dollar sign, Eric Dose, mm-hmm. E-R-I-C-D-O-C-E. Um, you can email me if you need to get in touch with me for booking or whatever at Eric Dose 3290 at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Um or just reach out to me through through the Instagram. I'm hoping to set up mm-hmm. a Patreon soon for that catalogs all my work, all my kind of like archiving kind of meme mm-hmm. work, uh, yes. shit posting work on Hamburger. Yeah. Cause that was almost shut down a month ago. I almost got. I uh, mean, it's a gold mine. Good. Thank you. Thank you Seriously, so much. Seriously, like I don't even wa- I don't really watch TV anymore. Um, yeah, no, and do I, I don't really I don't really like any. There's no other meme pages that can compare that I like or enjoy that are as consistent, but that also feature a lot of harp music, (laughs) are very inspirational. So that's a great meme page. Um, 
Thank you. And yeah, absolutely, it absolutely needs to be archived for sure. Yeah, I'm um, working on it. Working on it. it should yeah, be absolutely. On Patreon. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yes. Well, uh, thank wonderful. you so much for having me, Maddie. Of course. Uh, so yes, thank you so much, Eric. Oh my gosh, you are so inspiring. Um, yeah, I love I love talking to other musicians because it's like yeah. when you're. I mean, I'm sure you can relate. Like when you're uh, a look, you practice alone. You know, <laughs> you're just like in your room practicing. Um, and you're like in your own little head, like it's uh it's good to talk to other musicians and producers and stuff. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on. It's such a pleasure. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. All right. Have a good Better. rest of your night. Oh yeah, and, and scene. Uh, stop recording? Stop.